number of people of, of just some name, and of course I'm not naming them, but some name in our fellowship. Names that if I said them, you, you'd know who I was talking about. And all of a sudden they're saying things like, you know, Tony Campolo's video has just caused me to rethink the whole issue of the church and the Bible and homosexuality. And so I thought, I have to see this. And I did. I watched it a number of times. I've seen this video a lot of times and made notes on it. And it, and it didn't change anything in my mind. And my goal is to tell you why it hasn't. Tony Campolo is a brilliant man. And he's a great communicator. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at that video. And then we're going to pray. And then we'll go through the study and hopefully be all done by about 7.15ish. Is that all right with everybody? Agreed? Any contrary? It's carried. So let's show the video. Young people are not thinking the same way as the older people are on this. And they are not necessarily liberal. Uh, they are, uh, in fact, uh, very conservative in many circles. It's just that young people have reached a point where they say there is something that transcends our differences on this issue and it is our commonality in Jesus Christ and our love for Christ that transcends this issue and let me put it this way those who make it such a strong issue over the fact that in Romans the first chapter we have these very forceful words uh, prohibiting gay and lesbian uh, erotic behavior. I said that nicely. I have to be aware of the fact that uh, Jesus never addresses this issue directly. Now, one can say indirectly he talks about sexual sin, but he never addresses homosexuality per se. Not that he didn't know about it. I mean, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, he knew the Hebrew Bible well. I mean, but he never addresses this as one of the big sins. He does address with great severity the Pharisees who are always laying these legalistic rules on people. I think it's in Luke the 11th chapter where it says, Woe unto you Pharisees who lay this heavy burden on people and then do nothing to lift that burden. And I think young people are saying we're tired of a church that is laying this incredible burden on gay and lesbian people and does nothing to alleviate that burden. And that's the first thing. The second thing is, there's a, they smell hypocrisy. And the hypocrisy they smell is this, that while Jesus never speaks on same gender marriage, he does speak about the marriage of people who are divorced. People who are divorced, he said, who get married a second time are in an adulterous relationship. That's what Jesus said. Nobody's going to argue with me on that. And people say, and I agree with them, Yes, but you've got to show some grace. It's not that simple. There are circumstances that are so dehumanizing in some marriages that I've heard it all, and I agree with those who want to show grace to people who are divorced, uh, maybe because of not, even, not just physical abuse, but psychological abuse, humiliation, people losing their humanity, and they have to get out of the marriage just to survive. And they find somebody else, and they get married, and it's working. And they're in our churches. There isn't anybody that's going to be watching this that doesn't belong to a church that excludes people who are divorced and remarried. And the young people are saying things like, wait a minute, how can this church be so gracious to people who are in a sexual liaison that Jesus specifically condemns and be so hard on people who are in a sexual liaison that Jesus never even mentions. Yes, we do know it's talked about in Romans, but hey, uh, Jesus did not put this on his Big Ten hit list, and we're not going to put it there either. The study tonight, why Tony Campolo is wrong on the Bible, Jesus, Paul, divorce and remarriage, and homosexuality. Other than that, I have no beef with that <laughs> video. 
those notes that you have, they're brief, they're sketchy. Uh, I was hammering out the last part of them while the music was starting for the night service. So uh, no one's checked for typos. There might be all sorts of flubs and flaws. So just kind of overlook that. And let's just pray. Surely not one of us has the desire to put heavy legalistic burdens on anyone's back and not do anything to help. But surely we want to be faithful to biblical truth because, Jesus, you said it's only the truth that sets people free. It's not our sentiment that will set people free. It's not our love that will set people free. And it's not our acceptance that will set people free. It is your truth, the truth of your word that sets people f free. So there's, there's nothing more loving that a church can do than make sure that we always stand on the truth of your word. Because the whole truth of your word never makes us condemning and judgmental. The whole truth of your word, especially the truth about sin, always drives us to the cross of Jesus Christ and God's forgiving, gracious mercy and redemptive work in Christ. And so defend us from error and just guide our thoughts in these next few moments as we gather them around your word. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I don't want to take real long, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Here's where I think that video is absolutely wrong. And when I say that, I am stunned that supposedly biblically thinking people don't seem to see these things. One, he, that's Tony Campolo, he's wrong in the way he approaches Scripture playing Paul against Jesus. That's the first thing I want to talk about. Before we get to the issue of same-sex marriage or homosexuality, I want to talk about the Bible. I want to talk about what he says about the Bible and why I have such a hard time and why you should have such a hard time with it. It is simply a gross mistake to admit on one hand that Paul teaches one thing about homosexuality while downplaying it with the teaching of Jesus. I mean, how are we going to make sense of this? Given what we're studying Sunday morning, given the way the Bible states, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired, breathed out by God. How are we going to handle this? I mean, what that, what that means is that all the parts of Scripture, whether you're dealing with the book of Genesis, whether you're dealing with the words of Jesus in Matthew or the words of Paul in Romans or the words of Peter or James, it means whatever part of the Bible you go to, it's from God. It means that one part doesn't trump the other. And it means when you interpret Scripture, the job of any thoughtful learner of the Word of God is that we, we see the same picture. It's the same God. It's the same message that unfolds. The Bible is always in harmony with itself. And if it isn't, then I'm not, I'm not interpreting it right. I'm not approaching it right. Because it comes from one God, one divine mind behind the whole of Scripture. I can't think of a better example of what we've been considering even in Sunday mornings about the importance of teaching, the first thing we talked about. Church, we are in a day, if you haven't caught on yet, we are in a day when Christians need more than sincerity and loving thoughts about Jesus. Christians need to know how to study their Bibles. I couldn't believe the way Tony admits the strong statements of Paul in Romans, Romans 1, and then very carefully just shifts his attention. And he just pulls you in because he's a very smooth talker. Smooth talking about how, 
how uh, the young people spot the legalism of churches that put heavy burdens on other people's shoulders. And I go, wait a minute, whoa, 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 just a sec, really? Romans 1, legalism? Romans 1. Jesus did talk to the Pharisees about their taking the Old Testament Judaic sacrificial system and trying to apply it all to, to the New Testament era. But Jesus wasn't talking about Romans 1 when he said those things. Romans 1, by the way, is also where we find, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where is the power of God unto salvation. Legalism? He knows better than that. That's the annoying thing. He's not stupid. He knows better than that. It's just a way of arguing to pull gullible people in. This is such a bad example of handling Scripture. Remember, remember, it's called, Scripture, a sharp, double-edged sword. And there's a wonderful side of that and there's a dangerous side of that. Would you give your four-year-old a really, really sharp knife to play with? Well, why not? It, it dices carrots, it slices up potatoes, you can cut up onions. It's a wonderful thing, a really sharp knife. It is, but it, only when it's handled properly. There's something very dangerous about a sharp object when you don't handle it properly. Church, we need to know what we're doing with our Bibles because you can do a lot of damage with a double-edged sword if it's not handled correctly. And you never take one part of it to cancel out another. I don't, you don't have to, this is just me. You don't have to uh, follow my endorsement on this. Personally, that's all this is, personal taste. I, I when in my Bibles, I don't like red-letter Bibles. I know there's all sorts of books about red-letter Christians and blah, 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 blah. I don't like it because of the way it kind of... It's just... On a very subjective level, it sets up certain words as carrying more weight than other words. And I know what Jesus said is very precious. And nothing John or Paul or Peter or anybody else ever said ever contradicted anything Jesus said. It's all God's Word. But this is not a sermon against red-letter editions of the Bible, so don't worry about that. Two, Campolo is wrong in his motives for his argument. I don't know if you picked it up. In some strange fashion, he seems to think the church needs to rethink the Bible's teaching on homosexuality because, quote, the young people don't think like this anymore. And given the climate of the entertainment industry, and the lack of emphasis on teaching in the church, one would have to be amazed if the next generation did think the same way. In fact, we would be amazed if they even could think the same way. This is merely confusing truth with popular evangelical consensus and acceptability. There's simply no reason to change biblical teaching because it's getting harder and harder to hold on to it. Quite the contrary. The simple fact is this is predicted in the Scriptures. We, what should make us very suspicious is when everyone agrees with what the church is saying. There, stop and take a look at what you're teaching because it's not very likely you're true to God's Word anymore. Three, Campolo is absolutely wrong in his assessment of Jesus and homosexuality. A couple of things here. First, it's very dangerous, it's a dangerous game to measure Jesus' view of homosexuality by his silence on the subject and interpret that as saying, as he did at the end, it's not one of the big things with Jesus. And I'll tell you why that bothers me a lot. I've got a lot of translations of the Bible, and as far as I know, Jesus nowhere addressed the subject of sexually abusing small boys. Are we going to argue from his silence on that that Jesus wouldn't have a problem with that? 
Do you see the problem of arguing from silence? There's a lot of things Jesus didn't talk about. Are we going to assume that he's okay with it? Again, it's just such a destructive hermeneutic. Hermeneutic, by the way, it's, it's just a 25-cent word for a 5-cent one where, where it's just a matter of hermeneutic means how you interpret Scripture. That's called hermeneutics. And it's bad hermeneutics to say, Jesus didn't talk about this, therefore it wasn't a big deal. I would argue quite the opposite. My thinking would go something like this. Uh, the fact that Jesus, even when he addressed sexual sins, the fact that he only did so against the framework of heterosexuality tells us the exact opposite of what Campolo concludes. Even when Jesus is discussing sexual sins, he can only speak of them against the backdrop of the created order with one man, one woman, in a relationship of marriage for life. That should speak volumes to the church. Jesus speaks of sexual purity, sexual fidelity, and sexual transgression only in heterosexual terms. And it should make you go, hmm, why would that be? And I'll tell you why it is. It's because he has the same understanding of human sexuality that Paul has from Romans 1. And now you have a proper hermeneutic where you have the whole Bible saying the same thing. This is Jesus' way of relegating other sexual sins. It's not a light silence that Jesus doesn't address those things. It's his way of relegating them to anti-creational stature, just like the Apostle Paul did. Think about that. Whenever Jesus talks about fornication, whenever Jesus talks about adultery, he's always talking about a man and a... Always. Hmm. Why was that the only category he entertained? Interesting, isn't it? Four, and I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on this. I believe it's wrong and unloving to use Jesus' teaching on the remarriage of those divorced with a discussion of homosexual sins. Now, it's not tonight's subject to talk about divorce and remarriage. And I've done that. I've done that in detail. The series is called The Meaning of Marriage. There are, I believe, two or three whole messages on that subject. I'm not doing that tonight. Only to say my problem is Campolo's casual mention of divorced and remarried people living in some kind of perpetually sexually immoral liaison. That's the word he used toward the end. Did you hear it? Liaison. It's, it's the kind of word you use when some guy's on a business trip and he's meeting bubbles in a hotel room. I don't know why I said bubbles. Could have been <laughs> Trixie or Bambi with a heart or however, you know, I, I don't know. But whenever we talk of those things, we speak of them as liaisons, don't we? And it just has that, that seamy side to it. So he, he talks about people who are divorced and remarried in these immoral liaisons without even mentioning the many passages in the Bible speaking to the same issue. What, what, was, what was the cause for the divorce? Was it, was it, was it adultery? Was it... 1 Corinthians 7, an unbelieving partner leaving and the married partner, all Paul says is he's no longer bound and you have to figure out exactly what he means. But there's no, there's no working with any texts. It's just, you get a divorce and you marry this person there. Forever and ever and ever until Jesus comes back, he says you're in that immoral relationship as though it's just this perpetual affair. And, and I just... Boy, I need everyone to know that, that if you hear anybody saying that in this church, I'd sure like to know about it. It is not what we believe.
The biggest problem, the biggest problem is the way Campolo steps around the effects of grace to the sinner when the sin is confessed and repented of. Whatever your view of divorce and remarriage, and there are lots of views, whatever your view of divorce and remarriage, there's simply no way to treat the remarried Christian as forever locked into a perpetual state of adultery. And that's true, by the way, even even if there was no excuse for divorce and no excuse for the remarriage. It's still true. That's made abundantly clear when you think about it. It's made abundantly clear, by the way, even the Old Testament sets forth the idea that if a person divorces and remarries and then, and then wants to divorce and go back to his first wife and God speaks through Moses and says, no, sir, you can't do that. Which, which is surprising because, because if what Campolo is saying is true, then all these marriages are adulterous relationships and, and it would seem that the first one would be the pure, real marriage. And yet that's the only one God says, no, 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 you, you can't do that. It's not like switching hats. When you're in a marriage, you're in a marriage and you make the marriage work. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The fact is, God's grace doesn't just let sinners, all sinners, including divorced and remarried sinners. God's grace doesn't just let sinners off the hook. It erases the past. God's grace slices into the present situation with all its brokenness, with all its guilt, and it recreates a new beginning from that point on. This is how God's grace comes to all of us in our present sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed, separated, removed our transgressions. It's not just talking about forgiving. It's talking about... Did you ever think about that? It's just removing our transgressions. So, so here's, here's a person, and, I, and I've been a liar, and I lie a lot. And God's grace comes, and I'm redeemed. And I ask his forgiveness. And the teaching of the Bible is, from, I'm not a liar now until Jesus comes back. I get a fresh start. Right from that point. And when I do lie, if I fall into it again, I repent. And I turn from my wicked ways. But my fundamental identity, such were some of you, Paul says, but you've been washed, you've been sank. Were, that's what you were, not what you are. Somebody ought to just say, praise God. You know, that's just tremendous truth. And what Campolo does is he just, he just rides roughshod over that. And the reason he does is he has to if he's going to make his argument stick. The bad hermeneutic. This will go on YouTube and he might see it. And I'm still telling you it's a bad hermeneutic. Five. Campolo's argument is dangerous and falls precisely into Paul's warning in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy. And now I'm wishing he hadn't put these in the same list with homosexuality, aren't you? Greedy, drunkards, you need to think a lot about that in the church today. Nor revilers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. 
and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And the part I want to pull out is Paul's phrase, do not be deceived. It's right there at, at the last part of verse uh, 9. Do not be deceived. It's his plea. It's his plea to the church. That's to whom he's writing. And he writes to the church and he says, and he says there are going to come different voices. He's not talking about out there. He's talking about in here. And it fits with what I'm talking about in that YouTube video. There are going to come other voices right in the church. And people will be led to believe that God really wouldn't punish people eternity for those kinds of sins. He says, he says increasingly, people are going to start speaking in the church. And, and, and the thing they're going to be attacking is this idea that God could possibly be like that. God, God wouldn't really keep these people out of the kingdom of God. You will not inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul's concerned because he knows that in this day in which we live, we will find it harder and harder to picture God judging people toward whom the whole society shows nothing but an apathetic tolerance and says, just, just live however you want and be a nice person and God will be happy with you. Paul says that message is going to be running roughshod right through the church and people are going to buy it. Because, well, because nobody likes the idea that no, God might judge. And there's a lot of things on that list. And who likes the idea that maybe God's not as tolerant as, as the sitcoms are? And so, that's what concerns me a lot. It's not just about homosexuality, it's about sin. And what happens when people sin and don't repent? Where does that sin go? Do you ever ask yourself that? Do you ever sit and think some really serious questions through? When people sin, when people in the church sin and don't repent of those sins, what happens to them anyway? Have you got an answer to that question? Where do they go? Do they count? Makes you go, hmm... I know there's grace for all sorts of sin, sinful people. I haven't committed a homosexual sin, but I'm a sinner. So it's a relevant topic to me. Sin has to be repented of. Sin has to be admitted. It has to be measured against absolute biblical truth, not the changing standards of, of the whims of the culture in which we live. Which relates to the last point. One of the most tragic is Campolo's message robs the homosexual of the greatest and most needed love of all. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, love rejoices in the truth. Not, not the intellect rejoices in the truth, which is what you'd expect, but love. Why does love rejoice in the truth? Why would love rejoice in a hard truth like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11? Don't be deceived. List, 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 list won't inherit the kingdom of God. What's to rejoice about in that kind of truth? Well, there would be nothing to rejoice about whatsoever except, except once, once you identify something like this as a sin, now we have redemption because Jesus died for sins. And there's hope. You, you shall know the truth and, and the truth shall set you free. 
But any teaching like that YouTube video that just kind of says, well, I know there's stuff about it in Romans 1, but you know, Jesus didn't say much about it, so it shouldn't be a big deal. If you think those are loving comments, you're sadly mistaken. They aren't loving because what they do is they forever close the homosexual up to hearing his need of redemption, like Don Horvath needed redemption. Don't buy, don't buy the argument that when you don't talk about sin, you're somehow loving. That's, that's like going to a doctor and, he, and he, he feels around and he finds that tumor, but he thinks, you know what, if I, if I tell this person they have a tumor and that it, it just really feels malignant to me, it's just going to be so upsetting for them. They're not going to sleep. And it's just going to trouble them. Do you want that or do you want a doctor that says, here's the truth and, and here's what we can do about it? This isn't in your notes, but I was, I was uh, thinking. How would you handle things if you have a family member who's come out and, and they're gay? And I, I, you know, I just, I can't imagine. That's a hard situation. It's a hard situation usually, usually. There's no hard and fast rules. But usually it's a hard situation because that family member will interpret your biblical stand as being a lack of love for them. Typically that's what happens. And when they say you need to accept me, what they mean is you need, you need to you need to come to the place where you don't see what I'm doing as sinful. And so, and so that's a hard standoff for a Christian to say, okay, you're asking me then just to, just to deny the very foundation of my Christian faith. And if I don't, you're interpreting that as unloving. By the way, by the way, never allow someone to set all the ground rules where if they don't feel loved by you, Therefore, it's automatically true that you weren't loving toward them. Whether or not I'm loving toward someone is measured by my actions toward them, not by the way they feel about me. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And if you let their emotions be the trump card, well, I just don't feel accepted. I just, I just don't feel that this, you're loving me. Then you're forever chained to this. The only way they'll ever feel loving is if you absolutely... It's the most selfish thing. They don't mean it that way. It's the most selfish thing they can say because they're never going to feel loved until you agree with absolutely everything they say. And, and it's not a fair burden. By all means, don't persecute and discriminate and be nasty. We get that. Be loving. Treat them as Jesus would. But don't let them set the agenda and say, I don't feel good about this relationship, therefore you must not be treating me in a loving fashion. That doesn't follow. Somehow, I guess if it were me, I'd, I'd probably try and say something like, are you able to, are you able to love me in spite of my views that you think are so wrong. If I had a homosexual child, are you able to love me in spite of my views that you think are so wrong? And if, and if they said yes, then I would say then, why will you not give us the same courtesy and assume that we might be able to love you in spite of your wrong views? You know, it has to be a fair. It has to be a fair communication. Ultimately, ultimately, you can't love someone eternally and meaningfully without somehow loving them in truth, because love rejoices in the truth. Biblical love rejoices in the truth. So. I think Tony Campolo is absolutely wrong. I think Christians that are swayed by that are driven by sentiment. And I think it's going to do a lot of damage to the body of Christ and to the way we handle Scripture 
unless in churches in mass, and I'm afraid it's not going to happen. People identify some of those key categories and some of those key distinctions. Let's be a place, you know what? Every, every sinner in Newmarket should be able to come into this place and feel the love of the body of Christ and the truth of God's word at the same time. The things that people say, you know, cruel things that they say about the homosexual community aren't funny. And there should be a call for a love that goes beyond just apathy, but a love that is strong enough to give people the truth, both about sin and about redemption. How did you get saved? How did Jesus come into your heart? I'll tell you how, how it happened. Because it happens exactly the same way for everybody, regardless of what kind of sin you commit. You come to the place where you say, I'm a sinner. And, and, and I'm in the wrong. And thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. And come into my heart. Under your terms and under your lordship. I renounce all that I was in myself and put my trust in you. Everybody has to say that when they come to Jesus. All I'm saying is let's make sure it's the same gospel for everybody. Everyone said?